Hey, Redcon Raider here, and welcome back to Fallout Van Buren. I'll admit, it has been a while since the last time we talked about Interplay's original Fallout 3. But today, I thought we'd finally dust off my notes and pick up right where we left off last time, with design document number 15, which covers the fictional Bloomfield Space Center. Last time, we discussed the basics about this location, including its rather extensive backstory, as well as its general layout. That means today we'll be easing our way back into things by taking a look at the characters who were intended to help populate this location. And next time, we'll wrap up our analysis by taking a closer look at the quests and consequences that the location was meant to offer. The developers were actually planning to include a grand total of 37 assorted NPCs in and around the Bloomfield Space Center, 42 if you include the automated Gatling turrets. These characters were split disproportionately over three separate factions, including 26 members of a local raider gang, four NCR soldiers who were actually working for the game's main antagonist, and 11 assorted robots and turrets that were intended to help protect the facility from intruders, but which had also been compromised by Odysseus, the game's secondary antagonist. One of the most important things to understand about this location is that, much like with the reservation, it's an area designed with two distinct stages in mind. The player was clearly meant to visit this location at least twice throughout the main campaign, once towards the end of the game's first act, after they had rescued Jillian McKinley from the reservation, and then again towards the end of the game's second act, once it became clear that they would need to hijack the Hermes 13 space shuttle. This would certainly explain why, despite being a location that was absolutely integral to the endgame, the initial threat level was actually fairly low. When the player first arrived, they would find themselves confronted by raiders, robots, and turrets intended to challenge a level 8 character. It was only in Act 2 that Victor Presper's men would arrive, with each of those soldiers clocking in somewhere between level 15 and 20. With that in mind, let's start with the most prominent faction that the player was meant to encounter in this location, the Rusty Hooks. While various other details about the location would change depending on exactly when the player arrived, the Rusty Hooks were intended to be the one constant presence, at least until the player got involved. Now, I'm actually pretty sure we've spent some time talking about the Rusty Hooks in at least three of my previous videos, but we never really went into any significant amount of detail. Suffice to say, they're a mid-level group of raiders who had recently fallen on hard times, due in large part to the general incompetence of their current leader, Kyle the Hook, but also because, just like the player, they had inadvertently run afoul of Victor Presper's plans. Let's go back to the beginning. The gang was technically founded in 2246, roughly five years before the events of Van Buren. Originally part of a much larger gang, the Rusty Hooks were essentially the members who decided to stick around, after Kyle stole the previous leader's gun, a 44 caliber handgun, and then used it to murder him in his sleep, before declaring himself the gang's new leader. A cowardly and greedy opportunist, Kyle would have quickly run the gang into the ground, if not for one significant stroke of good fortune. Roughly one month after he took over the gang, he encountered a super mutant named Bear, who was guarding a caravan that the gang had decided to target. While Bear fought valiantly, killing six of the raiders in the process, he was eventually overwhelmed and the caravan was destroyed. Kyle ended up nursing the super mutant back to health, somehow convincing him to join the gang in the process, with Bear serving as both his bodyguard and his right-hand man. Bear proved to be surprisingly intelligent, with the gang owing much of its limited success to him rather than Kyle. His raw physical power and uh, seemingly unwavering loyalty to the gang's current leader 
also ensured that none of the other raiders would ever try to wrest control of the gang away from Kyle. Years later, in 2251, the gang's mechanic, Jillian McKinley, would somehow be infected with Dr. Victor Presper's personal strain of the new plague. Finding themselves pursued by robots from the Tibbetts prison facility, the gang fled south, with Jillian eventually being captured in May of that year. Although she would escape the Tibbetts prison facility alongside the player during the opening of Van Buren, she eventually would end up as a prisoner at the Ghoul Run settlement known as the Reservation, which is, of course, where the player would end up encountering her during the course of the main campaign. As for the rest of the gang, they continued wandering through the desert for over a year, eventually finding their way to the Bloomfield Space Center in June of 2252. Deciding that the Space Center would make an ideal new base of operations, they quickly moved in, only to lose two more of their number after Sid, the gang's replacement mechanic, accidentally reactivated the turrets guarding the nearby launch platform. Rather than abandoning the location, Kyle simply marked the landing pads as off-limits, and the gang made itself comfortable throughout the rest of the facility. This is where the player would eventually encounter them, sometime in late 2253, with the gang serving as one of the lesser obstacles, standing between them and the Hermes 13 space shuttle. From a gameplay standpoint, the majority of the gang consisted of 22 generic raiders, evenly split between men and women, and ranging between levels 6 and 8. They were armed with an assortment of basic weapons, including various small guns, rifles, and melee weapons, but notably nothing more powerful than Kyle the Hook's 44 caliber handgun. Unlike some of the more generic raiders that the player would encounter throughout the rest of the game, the rusty hooks would actually be surprisingly reasonable, at least relatively speaking. If the player happened to encounter one of their patrols or wandered into the space center itself, then the gang would first try to warn them away from their territory, rather than simply attacking on sight. This would give the player an ample opportunity to make a good impression, potentially granting them access to a new trading post, as well as an assortment of gang-related quests. The Rusty Hooks would only resort to violence if the player went out of their way to antagonize them, or if the player was foolish enough to make themselves an overly tempting target. While they were a gang of raiders, the Rusty Hooks didn't actually resort to just mindlessly mugging anyone they came across. Rather, they would only go on raiding expeditions when they were running low on supplies, at which point they would spend up to a month raiding caravans all over the Arizona region. The rest of the time, they actually got by on trade, as long as their trading partners didn't ask too many questions about where they got their merchandise. Much like many of the other groups or factions planned for Fallout Van Buren, the game would actually keep track of the gang's losses over time. If the gang suffered an excessive number of casualties, then this would actually be reflected in-game with less frequent patrols and diminishing numbers inside the space center itself. In addition, as long as Kyle remained in charge of the gang, it was effectively doomed, no matter how many members were still alive. Unless the player actively intervened, the entire gang would end up being wiped out roughly six months after the player had first encountered them. In that case, the next time the player visited the Space Center, they would only find scattered corpses, as well as Kyle's severed head. The only way to avoid this was by finding some way to replace Kyle with a more suitable leader. Roughly half the quests planned for the Bloomfield Space Center revolved around this specific story arc, with the players' decisions ultimately deciding not only whether the gang would survive, but also how they would survive, and who would end up leading them. Which, of course, brings us to the four named members of the gang. Kyle the Hook, Bear, Sid, and Jillian McKinley. We'll start things off with Kyle the Hook. Now, as his name implies, Kyle the Hook was, in fact, missing his left hand, 
and sported a razor-sharp hook in its place. He was the uncontested leader of the Rusty Hooks, both by virtue of being the gang's founder, but also because he was literally the guy with the biggest gun. He also had the unwavering loyalty of Bear, who, aside from serving as his bodyguard, also acted as his champion in the event of any leadership challenges, thus ensuring that his position as gang leader essentially remained unchallenged. Although he wasn't particularly smart, he considered himself to be a veritable genius, and would often attempt to make himself seem smarter by making up long, nonsensical words that he would randomly insert into his dialogue with the player. Despite his obvious arrogance, he would actually be surprisingly reasonable as well. But the quickest way to get on his bad side was by questioning his intelligence or his authority, especially if it involved calling him out on his made-up words. In the event of an outright conflict, Kyle was easily one of the most dangerous members of the gang. Not only was he level 12, well above the rest of the raiders, he also carried the powerful 44 caliber handgun that he had stolen from the gang's previous leader. On top of that, despite his shortcomings where intelligence and leadership were concerned, he was actually a savant with explosive devices, though it is admittedly unclear on exactly how that might come into play in the event of an actual combat encounter. In fact, the only member of the gang who was arguably more dangerous than Kyle was Bear, the super mutant who served as Kyle's reluctant bodyguard and enforcer. While he was obviously both bigger and stronger than Kyle, he was also more intelligent and commanded more respect from the rest of the gang. His previous experience as a member of the Master's Super Mutant Army, and then as a more humble caravan guard, had simply left him better equipped to manage a group of armed raiders. Despite Kyle's arrogance and theatrics, the gang actually owed much of its success to Bear's expertise, with the Super Mutant essentially serving as the brains behind the entire operation. As I mentioned earlier, Bear was actually one of the gang's very first victims, originally working as a guard on a caravan that the gang had targeted one month after Kyle had first taken command. It was a conflict that left six members of the gang dead, the caravan destroyed, and Bear on the verge of death. But despite that, the mutant had since become a seemingly loyal member of the Rusty Hooks, following all of Kyle's orders without question. Now, that might actually sound somewhat familiar, if you've previously watched my videos about the recruitable companions planned for Fallout Van Buren. As I revealed there, the simple truth behind Kyle and Bear's unusual relationship was that Kyle had actually rigged the unfortunate super mutant with a miniature bomb. He had forced the gang's medic, Sid, to implant the device at gunpoint back when they were first nursing the super mutant back to health. In truth, Bear actually hated Kyle, but obeyed him out of a sense of self-preservation. If he ever stepped out of line, then Kyle would immediately detonate the device, bringing the super mutant's life to a quick and painful end. Discovering this fact was pivotal if the player wanted to recruit Bear as a potential companion. Now, we'll spend a little more time talking about this in the next video, but for now, suffice to say that recruiting Bear required the player to either neutralize the explosive device, in which case Bear would join them out of gratitude, or to simply seize control of it instead, in which case Bear would serve them for fear of being executed. Either way, Bear had the potential to be a particularly useful and powerful companion. Not only was he well-versed in the art of combat, favoring a peculiar bear trap-like weapon of his own design, but he was also surprisingly knowledgeable about the other major factions, including the NCR, the Enclave, and even the Brotherhood of Steel. In fact, he even knew the true purpose behind the Bloomfield Space Center, the Hermes Space Shuttles, and Bomb Station 1, but he kept it to himself because he didn't believe that anyone else in the gang was smart or responsible enough to be trusted with that kind of information. 
The one possible exception was Jillian McKinley, whom Bear was secretly in love with. But she would be missing if the player hadn't already rescued her from the reservation. And it also wasn't really clear if she was even aware that Bear was infatuated with her. Next, we've got Sid, the gang's former part-time medic and current reluctant mechanic. Although he was modestly talented with both medical and mechanical tasks, his self-esteem was abysmally low. He was actually the second most talented mechanic in the gang, behind Jillian McKinley, but Kyle kept him in check with daily verbal abuse, and sometimes even threats of physical abuse or outright execution. Under normal circumstances, Sid much preferred to simply keep his head down. He was a slacker at heart and content to let other members of the gang do all the heavy lifting. Unfortunately, that simply wasn't possible after Jillian's disappearance. Left as the gang's only mechanic, it fell to him to help restore power to the Bloomfield Space Center, something he at least partially succeeded at, but which also resulted in reactivating the facility's turrets, directly resulting in two other members of the gang being killed. Knowing that Kyle's patience was rapidly wearing thin, Sid found himself under increasingly mounting pressure to find some way to prove his worth. On top of that, he was also struggling with crippling guilt due to the unwilling role he had played in forcibly recruiting Bear as Kyle's reluctant bodyguard. In fact, he was the only other member of the gang that knew the truth about Kyle and Bear, something which Kyle had forbidden him from revealing to anyone else. This was yet another reason why he knew that he had to prove himself to be indispensable to the rest of the gang, lest Kyle should simply decide to remove him from the gang entirely. This would help explain some of Sid's more irrational behavior, such as his tendency to engage in sudden screaming fits when frustrated, or his susceptibility to fall into bouts of severe depression. It would also help explain why he would initially be fairly brusque with the player, but would quickly grow friendlier if the player could find some way to help improve his situation. He would eagerly accept any offer to help complete one of his pet projects or to further improve the gang's living conditions, basically anything that would make him look better in front of Kyle. He would also be greatly relieved if the player rescued Jillian McKinley, which would allow him to once again gracefully fade into the background. As for Jillian herself, well, she was something of a wild card. We actually already talked about her back during our series about design document number 14. Most of the information in document number 15 actually retreads what we already know from the previous document, but her presence would modify the player's interactions with the rusty hooks in some particularly important ways. For one thing, it would obviously make it much easier for the player to gain a positive reputation with the gang, something which would otherwise require the player to either possess significant speech skills or to go out of their way to assist the Rusty Hooks during various random encounters. It would also go a great ways towards helping Sid with his unfortunate situation though it would end up depriving the player of a few potential opportunities if they actually preferred to take advantage of Sid's growing desperation. Perhaps most notably, returning Jillian to the Bloomfield Space Center would give less tech-savvy players a means of repairing and restoring the hardware that they would eventually need to commandeer the Hermes 13. That would only work if the player had stayed on her good side and hadn't antagonized the Rusty Hooks. If the player had already alienated Jillian, or even worse, destroyed the Rusty Hooks, then they would just have to look elsewhere for assistance, possibly by recruiting one of the other mechanically-minded companions, such as Arcade Ganon or Otto Steed. Beyond the Rusty Hooks, the other NPCs slated for this location were much simpler obstacles that the player would need to overcome if they wanted to commandeer the Hermes 13. This would consist of six pre-war sentry robots that were scattered around the facility, as well as the five Gatling turrets that were specifically guarding the launch platform. Again, we actually talked about these last time, so we won't really spend much time on them here. 
It is important to note, however, that the Sentry robots would actually pose a much greater threat to the player during the first act of the game. At that point, Odysseus would have them under standing orders to watch out for the Tibbets' escapees, including both the player and Jillian McKinley. If either of those individuals showed up at the Bloomfield Space Center during Act 1, then the Sentry robots would immediately try to attack and presumably kill them. Depending on the exact circumstances of this encounter, it was possible that the Rusty Hooks would end up coming to the player's aid, especially if Jillian McKinley was involved. Once the player had reached Act 2, however, the player would have presumably already found a way to disable or otherwise deal with Odysseus. At that point, the Sentry robots would no longer be under standing orders to capture or kill the player on sight. In that case, the robots and turrets would only pose a threat to the player if they were caught trespassing in specific restricted areas, most notably the launch platform or the adjoining catwalks. Of course, at that point, the player would also have to deal with a new threat in the form of four nameless NCR soldiers who were working for Dr. Victor Presper. They accompanied the doctor to the Bloomfield Space Center, where they bypassed the security using some old credentials, and then commandeered the Hermes 14 so that Presper and a hand-picked squad of his most loyal men could travel to Bomb Station 1. The four soldiers they left behind were given express orders to guard the facility in their absence. Equipped with combat armor, grenades, and high-powered rifles, these soldiers were some of the deadliest opponents in the entire game, made even deadlier if the player hadn't found some way to disable or otherwise bypass the turrets and sentry bots. If those were still active, then the player would have to deal with them as well, because they would ignore the soldiers, but still end up attacking the player as soon as they set foot on the platform. What's more, if the Rusty Hooks were still around, then that had the potential to complicate the situation even further. Recognizing that they didn't stand a chance against the heavily armed soldiers, the Rusty Hooks would instead work out an uneasy truce with them. The soldiers would allow the gang to continue living at the facility as long as the raiders agreed to stay out of their way. In this case, the Rusty Hooks would also agree to help keep other people out of the facility as well, which would make things more difficult for the player if they hadn't already established a positive relationship with the gang. However, if the player had befriended the gang, either by helping Bear overthrow Kyle, or even by taking over the gang themselves, then the gang could instead provide valuable assistance when the player was finally ready to make their move. Now that pretty much covers all of the NPCs planned for the Bloomfield Space Center, with one rather notable exception. The sole remaining NPC was a peculiar brain bot named SOR-1000 Gamma, which the player could only encounter once as part of a special random encounter. This was one of the four SOR-1000 brain bots designed to both guard and maintain Bomb Station 1. Although the exact circumstances are pretty fuzzy, this particularly powerful brain bot somehow ended up in one of the station's escape pods and was subsequently launched back to Earth. Although largely undamaged by the landing, it was very confused. When the player encountered it out in the desert, it would be wandering around erratically, and if the player got too close, then it would end up attacking them. This was another potentially deadly encounter. While the document doesn't list any stats for SOR-1000 Gamma, it is worth noting that his three counterparts, Alpha, Beta, and Delta, are actually included in design document number 16, where they're listed as level 20 threats. These specialized brain bots are not only incredibly tough, but are also outfitted with four arms, two equipped with standard manipulators, and two equipped with powerful laser weapons. Fortunately for the player, document number 16 specifically mentions that these robots are still vulnerable to EMP grenades and standard pulse weaponry, so a properly equipped player could potentially defeat it, 
or at least slow it down long enough to escape. Assuming the player did successfully overcome the malfunctioning brain bot, they would be rewarded with some combat XP, whatever high-tech components they could salvage from the wreckage, and a hollow disk loaded with a little more information about Bomb Station 1. And that's pretty much it for NPCs, at least for this design document. We do still have a fair amount to talk about, including 23 assorted quests and a small handful of other random encounters. But, like I said before, we're really just easing ourselves back into things. After all, it has been over a year since I recorded episode 31. That said, we'll hit the pause button for now, but we'll pick up here next time as we complete our analysis of design document number 15. But for now, this is Redcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for listening. Oh, and remember, although I do love talking about Fallout Van Buren, you can check out most of the leaked documents for yourself by visiting the Fan Run wikis. As always, links are in the description. <laughs>